You're watching Bye Bye Wilmington on CBS 10 WILM. Here's your host, Don Ansel. What a day for a daydream. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what a day for a daydream. You know, it's funny because I remember uh, almost, you know, very clearly where I was when I first heard that or what was going on in the world when I first heard uh, a lot of the music of the Love and Spoonful. Where'd the name come from? Uh, Mississippi John Hurd, very famous uh, Delta blues artist. Uh, John Sebastian knew him when he was in Greenwich Village, in fact, would uh, run errands for Sippy John. And one of uh, Mississippi John's songs is called Coffee Blues. Right. And in that song, there's a lyric, I love my baby by the Love and Spoonful. And that's where the, t the name of the band came from. But I mean, who, who yanked that out of that, that tune and said, hey, this is our... John Sebastian. John Sebastian. Yeah, and he ran it by everybody in the band, and I was like taken back at first. I was like, well, that's kind of real off the wall for a band name, because I was used to, you know, Joey and the Maytones and uh, the Kingsmen, that was the name right. of our band. But uh, so it took me about a week to get into it, but after I did, I went, yeah. And then I listened to the whole song, you know, and uh, it's a very interesting lyric once you take in the whole song and, and understand what Mississippi John was saying. Who wrote the songs for The Love and Spoonful? Who wrote that song? No, who wrote the songs? Oh, John Sebastian wrote the majority of the okay. songs. Uh, he and I co-wrote on several of our big hits, Summer in the City, and uh, You Didn't Have to Be So Nice, and Full Measure were songs that John and I co-wrote. And then there were a couple of songs that the whole band wrote, uh, mostly on the soundtrack albums that we did. Yeah, uh, and we'll get into that, because uh, uh, Paul Simon tapped you to do a... a That's a, a, some soundtrack work and and appear in the movie and too. appear in the, yeah yeah mm -hmm. do you believe in magic you didn't have to be so nice daydream did you ever have to make up your mind summer in the city rain on the roof darling be home soon for a couple of years the spoonful dominated the charts yeah with these hits. yeah we did in fact a lot of people said we were sort of the answer to the Beatle, the american answer to the beetle on the british invasion also, we were one of the very first groups that were given the freedom to go into the studio and write and produce our own songs. And so, for the most part, we were given a lot of leeway that up until that time, bands weren't given. They had a producer come in and pretty much tell them what to play and what song to write and how to sing it. But our record company gave us the freedom to just go right ahead and do it the way you want to do it. Because and, it's working. <laughs> because it's working, yeah. exactly. Um, and, and, and it became known as good time music. Yeah. Be, uh, I mean, it, 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 and, and uh, that label has stuck, really. Well, the, you know, we did sound. a four-song uh, uh, Electra Records wanted to sign the Love and Spoonful very badly. And they did an album with Paul Butterfield and us and uh, two other artists on it. And four of the cuts on it were by the Love and Spoonful. It was called What's Shake, and one of them was a John Sebastian original called Good Time Music. And we never released it as a Love and Spoonful single, but after it was on that record, we sort of adopted Good Time Music as our motto, if right. you will. H how well did y'all get along? In the band? In, yeah. Oh, fantastic. You did? Oh, it was just, the chemistry was superb. And uh, Did you hang out on off stage? We had within a stone's throw of each other apartments in the village. Yes. So yeah, we hung out off stage. You know, we had our own private lives, but uh, pretty much we were like best friends. But this had to be, I mean, this was in, in, your, in your, uh, your scope, this, this, this life that you all of a sudden were living. It had to be kind of surreal. It was totally surreal, and you know, because they got it done in that six month time frame, or we got it done, and, and I was out in California just about six months of the day, I told them that's how long I would do it, and we heard You Believe in Magic on the radio out there. Uh, it became surreal from that point. It was almost like, uh, you know, this is like a dream, but you know, I never thought we were gonna wake up from it, and it wasn't going to be happening. There was a real spirit of, uh, can do and uh, and we belong to be here was there pressure to keep it all happening oh, absolutely and in fact the record company put a lot of pressure on us to duplicate last year's hit with this and make it sound the same and we were very against that we wanted all of our singles to sound unique 
indifferent. So we tried to avoid that cloning right. the sound of your last record. And of course, this was the 60s. And how prevalent were drugs? Oh, they were everywhere. You yeah. know, there's, uh, you know, they say that saying that if you uh, remember the 60s, you weren't there. <laughs> but the Love and Spoonful was not, you know, one of the things that was always a, a misnomer or a misunderstanding was the Love and Spoonful was presumed to be a, a name about drug use. And as I said earlier, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a song about making love. And uh, the title had nothing to do with right. drug use. And the Love and Spoonful was not a heavy drug using band. Right. I mean, we just weren't. You know, for whatever reasons, we were, you know, pretty much guys that just did our thing, played our music, and that was the most important thing who, to us. Who were some of the people that, that you met that, like, took your breath away? Well, you know, getting to meet Ray, well, Bob Dylan. Now, uh, when we were rehearsing the Love and Spoonful, uh, Bob Dylan called John Sebastian up, and when we first started out, we weren't famous, we hadn't even played a gig yet, and he asked John if he would come into New York and do a bass recording for one of his albums. So I had a car, and I drove John into the city, <laughs> and we got in there, and John couldn't do the part, but he said to Bob, he said, hey, listen, I've just met this bass player here, he's with him, why don't you give him a try? So I picked up the bass and sat down and played about three or four songs on that recording. And, and then after the, sh the session was over, we all got in the Plymouth station wagon and drove around Manhattan, Bob Dylan, me, uh, Bobby Newworth, and uh, John Sebastian. So that was kind of like meeting him, because oh. he was such a superstar at that time. That was pretty cool. But getting to meet like Ray Charles at the Tammy show and artists like that, Chuck Berry, yeah. you know, to actually meet them that were my idols as a sure. kid was just superb. Do, do you think you were prepared for the success that, that happened? Well, prepared in, you know, you're never prepared for things that happen unexpectedly. And I think the scope of our success wasn't exactly anticipated. We didn't have British accents. <laughs> And so and that you know, was the British explosion was happening, yeah. Well, yeah, and that was pretty much if you didn't have a British accent, you couldn't, couldn't get happen. signed. Yeah. But was, you had, but you did, and were, and and so that part was you were a kind little, of unique in that way. Actually, we were unique time. in that way. We also were we bridged the gap between folk music, non-electric, and electric folk music. And you stayed together with the original uh, group for how long? Well, the original group toured from 1965 till 1968. Right. And then first to go was Zal. Then Zali left the band in 1967, pursue a solo career. Zalianovsky. Zalianovsky. Right. Zali. Zali. And uh, in 19... With the big smile is how Oh, I man, a tremendous. That guy was, in, I mean, he could light up a room, not yeah. only with his smile, just his personality. He yeah. was just a superb person, entertainer. He left to pursue a solo career. That's right. In 1967, that's when Jerry Esther joined. And Jerry actually had played piano on Do You Believe in Magic, our first hit record. So he was kind of already a Love and Spoonful right. member. And then in 1968, uh, we finished our last album, uh, and uh, did a couple of tours supporting that, and then John left, and then Joe and Jerry and I stayed on for about another six months, and then we all just hung it up. But, they're, <laughs> but they didn't, and we'll come back and talk more. Our guest is uh, Steve Boone, bass guitarist for The Love and Spoonful. Stay with us. <laughs> 